Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. The Well Told Tale is now available as a podcast on YouTube and via our Patreon page, where there are additional stories exclusively for patrons. Please do check out the link in the description if you're interested in that. Today we reach the finale of Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom by Cory Doctorow. Who did kill Julius? What will happen to the park, and will Julius manage to win Lil back? We find out all that and more. As before, there are adult themes here, and there is adult language as well. So, that said, it's time to pull up a chair, relax, and enjoy the finale of Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom by Cory Doctorow. Chapter 7 The meds helped me to cope with the next couple of days, starting the rehab on the mansion. We worked all night erecting a scaffolding around the façade, though no real work would be done on it. We wanted the appearance of rapid progress, and besides, I had an idea. I worked alongside Dan, using him as a personal secretary, handling my calls, looking up plans, monitoring the net for the first grumblings of the Disney-going public realising that the mansion was being taken down for a full-blown rehab. We didn't exchange any unnecessary words, standing side by side without ever looking into one another's eyes. I couldn't really feel awkward around Dan anyway. He never let me, and besides, we had our hands full directing disappointed guests away from the mansion. A depressing number of them headed straight for the Hall of Presidents. We didn't have to wait long for the first panicked screed about the mansion to appear. Dan read it aloud off his HUD. Hey, anyone hear anything about scheduled maintenance at the HM? I just buzzed by on the way to the new H of P's, and it looks like some big stuff's afoot. Scaffolding, cast members swarming in and out. See the pick. I hope they're not screwing up a good thing. By the way, don't miss the new H of P's. Very bitchin'. Right, I said. Who's the author, and is he on the list? Dan cogitated a moment. She is Kim Wright, and she's on the list. Good Wuffy, lots of mansion fanac, big readership. Call her, I said. This was the plan. Recruit rabid fans right away, get them in costume and put them up on the scaffolds, give them outsized bat-adorned tools, and get them to play at construction activity in thumpy undead pantomime. In time, Sunip and his gang would have a batch of telepresence robots up and running, and we'd move to them, get them wandering the queue area, interacting with curious guests. The new mansion would be open for business in 48 hours albeit in stripped-down fashion. The scaffolding made for a nice weenie, a visual draw that would pull the hordes that thronged Deborah's Hall of Presidents over for a curious peek or two. Buzz City. I'm a pretty smart guy. Dan paged this Kim person and spoke to her as she was debarking the Pirates of the Caribbean. I wondered if she was the right person for the job. She seemed awfully enamoured of the rehabs that Deborah and her crew had performed. If I'd had more time, I would have run a deep background check on every one of the names on my list, but that would have taken months. Dan made some small talk with Kim, speaking aloud in deference to my handicap before coming to the point. We read your posts about the mansion's rehab. You're the first one to notice it, and we wondered if you'd be interested in coming by to find out a little more about our plans. Dan winced. She's a screamer, he whispered. Reflexively, I tried to pull up an HUD with my files on the mansion fans we hoped to recruit. Of course, nothing happened. I'd done that a dozen times that morning, and there was no end in sight. I couldn't seem to get lathered up about it, though, nor about anything else, not even the hickey just visible under Dan's collar. The transdermal mood balancer on my bicep was seeing to that. Doctor's orders. Fine, fine, we're standing by the pet cemetery. Two cast members, male in mansion costumes, about 5'10", apparent 30. You can't miss us. She didn't. She arrived out of breath and excited, jogging. She was apparent twenty and dressed like a real twenty-year-old in hipster climate-control cowl that clung to and released her limbs, which were long and double-kneed. 
all the rage amongst the younger set, including the girl who'd shot me. But the resemblance to my killer ended with her dress and body. She wasn't wearing a designer face, rather one that had enough imperfections to be the one she was born with, eyes set close and nose wide and slightly squashed. I admired the way she moved through the crowd, fast and low, but without jostling anyone. Kim, I called as she drew near, over here. She gave a happy shriek and made a beeline for us. Even charging full bore, she was good enough at navigating the crowd that she didn't brush against a single soul. When she reached us, she came up short and bounced a little. Hi, I'm Kim, she said, pumping my arm with the peculiar violence of the extra jointed. Julius, I said, then waited while she repeated the process with Dan. So, she said, what's the deal? I took her hand. Kim, we've got a job for you, if you're interested. She squeezed my hand hard and her eyes shone. I'll take it, she said. I laughed and so did Dan. It was a polite, cast memory sort of laugh, but underneath was relief. I think I'd better explain it to you first, I said. Explain away, she said, and gave my hand another squeeze. I let go of her hand and ran down an abbreviated version of the rehab plans, leaving out anything about Deborah and her ad hocs. Kim drank it all in greedily. She cocked her head at me as I ran it down, eyes wide. It was disconcerting, and I finally asked, Are you recording this? Kim blushed. I hope that's okay. I'm starting a new mansion scrapbook. I have one for every ride in the park, but this one's going to be a world beater. Here was something I hadn't thought about. Publishing ad hoc business was taboo inside Park, so much so that it hadn't occurred to me that the new cast members we brought in would want to record every little detail and push it out over the net as a big old wuffy collector. I can switch it off, Kim said. She looked worried, and I really started to grasp how important the mansion was to the people we were recruiting, how much of a privilege we were offering them. Leave it rolling, I said. Let's show the world how it's done. We led Kim into a utility door and down to costuming. She was half naked by the time we got there, literally tearing off her clothes in anticipation of getting into character. Sonia, a Liberty Square ad hoc that we'd stashed at costuming, already had clothes waiting for her, a rotting maid's uniform with an oversized tool belt. We left Kim on the scaffolding, energetically troweling a water-based cement substitute onto the wall, scraping it off and moving to a new spot. It looked boring to me, but I could believe that we'd have to tear her away when the time came. We went back to trawling the net for the next candidate. By lunchtime, there were ten drilling, hammering, troweling new cast members around the scaffolding, pushing black wheelbarrows, singing grim, grinning ghosts, and generally having a high old time. This'll do, I said to Dan. I was exhausted and soaked with sweat, and the transdermal under my costume itched, despite the happy juice in my bloodstream. A streak of uncast memberly crankiness was shot through my mood. I needed to get off stage. Dan helped me hobble away, and as we hit the utility door, he whispered in my ear, This was a great idea, Julius, really. We jumped a tram over to Imagineering, my chest swollen with pride. Sunip had three of his assistants working on the first generation of mobile telepresence robots for the exterior, and had promised a prototype for that afternoon. The robots were easy enough, just off-the-shelf stuff, really, but the costumes and kinematics routines were something else. Thinking about what he and Sunip's gang of hyper-creative super-geniuses would come up with cheered me up a little, as did being out of the public eye. Sunip's lab looked like it had been hit by a tornado. Imagineer packs rolled in and out with arcane gizmos or formed tight argumentative knots in the corners as they shouted over whatever their HUDs were displaying. In the middle of it all was Sunip, who looked like he was barely restraining an urge to shout, Yippee! He was clearly in his element. He threw his arms open when he caught sight of Dan and me, threw them wide enough to embrace the whole mad, gibbering chaos. What wonderful flumgubbery! he shouted over the noise. Sure is, I agreed. How's the prototype coming? Sunip waved absently, his short fingers describing trivialities in the air. 
In due time, in due time, I've put that team onto something else, a kinematics routine for a class of flying spooks that use gas bags to stay aloft, silent and scary. It's old spy tech, and the retrofit's coming tremendously. Take a look. He pointed a finger at me and presumably squirted some data my way. I'm offline, I reminded him gently. He slapped his forehead, took a moment to push his hair off his face, and gave me an apologetic look. Of course, of course. Uh, here. He unrolled an LCD and handed it to me. A flock of spooks danced on the screen, rendered against the ballroom scene. They were thematically consistent with the existing mansion ghosts, more funny than scary, and their faces were familiar. I looked around the lab and realised that they'd caricatured various Imagineers. Ah, you've noticed, Sunip said, rubbing his hands together. A very good joke, yes? This is terrific, I said carefully, but I really need some robots up and running by tomorrow night, Sunip. We discussed this, remember? Without telepresence robots, my recruiting would be limited to fans like Kim, who lived in the area. I had broader designs than that. Sunip looked disappointed. Of course, we discussed it. I don't like to stop my people when they have good ideas, but there's a time and a place. I'll put them on it right away. Leave it to me. Dan turned to greet someone, and I looked to see who it was. Lil, of course. She was raccoon-eyed with fatigue, and she reached out for Dan's hand, saw me, and changed her mind. Uh, hi, guys, she said with studied casualness. Oh, hello, said Sunip. He fired his finger at her. The flying ghosts, I imagined. Lil's eyes rolled up for a moment, then she nodded exhaustedly at him. Very good, she said. I just heard from Lisa. She says the indoor crews are on schedule. They've got most of the animatronics dismantled, and they're taking down the glass in the ballroom now. The ballroom ghost effects were accomplished by means of a giant pane of polished glass that laterally bisected the room. The mansion had been built around it. It was too big to take out in one piece. They say it'll be a couple of days before they've got it cut up and ready to remove. A pocket of uncomfortable silence descended on us, the roar of the Imagineers rushing in to fill it. You must be exhausted, Dan said at length. God, I'm right, I said, at the same moment that Lil said... I guess I am. We both smiled wanly. Sunip put his arms around Lil's and my shoulders and squeezed. He smelled of an exotic cocktail of industrial lubricant, ozone, and fatigue poisons. You two should go home and give each other a massage, he said. You've earned some rest. Dan met my eye and shook his head apologetically. I squirmed out from under Sunip's arm and thanked him quietly, then slunk off to the contemporary for a hot tub and a couple of hours of sleep. I came back to the mansion at sundown. It was cool enough that I took a surface route, costume rolled in a shoulder bag instead of riding through the clattering, air-conditioned comfort of the utility doors. As a freshening breeze blew across me, I suddenly had a craving for real weather, the kind of climate I'd grown up with in Toronto. It was October, for Christ's sakes, and a lifetime of conditioning told me that it was May, I stopped and leaned on a bench for a moment and closed my eyes. Unbidden and with the clarity of an HUD, I saw High Park in Toronto, clothed in its autumn colours, fiery reds and oranges, shades of evergreen and earthy brown. God, I needed a vacation. I opened my eyes and realised that I was standing in front of the Hall of Presidents, and that there was a queue ahead of me for it, one that stretched back and back. I did a quick sum in my head and sucked air between my teeth. They had enough people for five or six full houses waiting here, easily an hour's wait. The hall never drew crowds like this. Deborah was working the turnstiles in Betsy Ross Gingham, and she caught my eye and snapped a nod at me. I stalked off to the mansion. A choir of zombie-shambling new recruits had formed up in front of the gate and were groaning their way through grim, grinning ghosts with a new call-and-response structure. A small audience participated, urged on by the recruits on the scaffolding. Well, at least that's going right, I muttered to myself. And it was, except that I could see members of the ad hoc looking on from the sidelines, and the looks weren't kindly. Totally obsessive fans are a good measure of a ride's popularity, but they're kind of a pain in the ass, too. They lip-sync the soundtrack, catch souvenirs, and pester you with smarmy, show-off questions. 
After a while, even the cheeriest cast member starts to lose patience, develop an automatic distaste for them. The Liberty Square ad hocs who were working on the mansion had been railroaded into approving a rehab, press ganged into working on it, and were now forced to endure the company of these grandstanding mega fans. If I'd been there when it all started, instead of sleeping, I may have been able to massage their bruised egos, but now I wondered if it was too late. Nothing for it but to do it. I ducked into a utility door, changed into my costume and went back on stage. I joined the call and response enthusiastically, walking around to the ad hocs and getting them to join in, reluctantly or otherwise. By the time the choir retired, sweaty and exhausted, a group of ad hocs were ready to take their place, and I escorted my recruits to an off-stage break room. Sunip didn't deliver the robot prototypes for a week, and told me that it would be another week before I could have even five production units. Though he didn't say it, I got the sense that his guys were out of control, so excited by the freedom from ad hoc oversight that they were running wild. Sunip himself was nearly a wreck, nervous and jumpy. I didn't press it. Besides, I had problems of my own. The new recruits were multiplying. I was staying on top of the fan response to the rehab from a terminal I had installed in my hotel room. Kim and her local colleagues were fielding millions of hits every day, their waffy accumulating as envious fans around the world logged in to watch their progress on the scaffolding. That was all according to plan. What wasn't according to plan was that the new recruits were doing their own recruiting, extending invitations to their net pals to come on down to Florida, bunk on their sofas and guest beds, and present themselves to me for active duty. The tenth time it happened, I approached Kim in the break room. Her gorge was working, her eyes tracked invisible words across the middle distance. No doubt she was penning yet another breathless missive about the magic of working in the mansion. Hey there, I said, have you got a minute to meet with me? She held up a single finger, then a moment later gave me a bright smile. Hi, Julius, she said. Sure. Why don't you change into civvies? We'll take a walk through the park and talk. Kim wore her costume every chance she got. I'd been quite firm about her turning it into the laundry every night instead of wearing it home. Reluctantly, she stepped into a change room and switched into her cowl. We took the utility door into the fantasy land exit and walked through the late afternoon rush of children and their adults, queued deep and thick for Snow White, Dumbo and Peter Pan. How are you liking it here? I asked. Kim gave a little bounce. Oh, Tullius, it's the best time of my life, really. A dream come true. I'm meeting so many interesting people and I'm feeling really creative. I can't wait to try out the telepresence rigs, too. Well... I'm really pleased with what you and your friends are up to here. You're working hard, putting on a good show. I like the songs you've been working up, too. She did one of those double-kneed shuffles that was the basis of any number of action vids these days and was suddenly standing in front of me, hand on my shoulder, looking into my eyes. She looked serious. Is there a problem, Julius? If there is, I'd rather we just talked about it instead of making chit-chat. I smiled and took her hand off my shoulder. How old are you, Kim? Nineteen, she said. What's the problem? Nineteen? Jesus, no wonder she was so volatile. But what's my excuse, then? It's not a problem, Kim. It's just something I want to discuss with you. The people you all have been bringing down to work for me, they're all really great cast members. But... But we have limited resources around here. Not enough hours in the day for me to stay on top of the new folks, the rehab, everything. Not to mention that until we open the new mansion, there's a limited number of extras we can use out front. I'm concerned that we're going to put someone on stage without proper training, or that we're going to run out of uniforms. I'm also concerned about people coming all the way here and discovering that there aren't any shifts for them to take. She gave me a relieved look. Is that all? Don't worry about it. I've been talking to Deborah over at the Hall of Presidents, and she says she can pick up any people who can't be used at the mansion. We could even rotate back and forth. She was clearly proud of her foresight. My ears buzzed. Deborah, one step ahead of me all along the way. She probably suggested to Kim to do some extra recruiting in the first place. She'd taken the people who came down to work the mansion, convinced them they'd been hard done by by the Liberty Square crew, 
and rope them into her little Wuffy ranch, the better to seize the mansion, the park, the whole of Walt Disney World. Oh, I don't think it'll come to that, I said carefully. I'm sure we can find a use for them in the mansion. More the merrier. Kim cocked quizzically, but let it go. I bit my tongue. The pain brought me back to reality, and I started planning costume production, training rosters, bunking. God, if only Sunip would finish the robots. What do you mean, no? I said hotly. Lil folded her arms and glared. No, Julius, it won't fly. The group is already upset that all the glory is going to the new people. They'll never let us bring more in. They also won't stop working on the rehab to train them, costume them, feed them and mother them. They're losing Wuffy every day that the mansions shut up and they don't want any more delays. Dave's already joined up with Deborah and I'm sure he's not the last one. Dave, the jerk who'd pissed all over the rehab in the meeting, of course he'd gone over. Lil and Dan stood side by side on the porch of the house where I'd lived. I'd driven out that night to convince Lil to sell the ad hocs on bringing in more recruits, but it wasn't going according to plan. They wouldn't even let me in the house. So what do I tell Kim? Tell her whatever you want, Lil said. You brought her in. You manage her. Take some goddamn responsibility for once in your life. It wasn't going to get any better. Dan gave me an apologetic look. Lil glared a moment longer, then went into the house. Deborah's doing really well, he said. The net's all over her. Biggest thing ever. Flash baking is taking off in nightclubs. Dance mixes, with the DJ's backup being shoved in bursts into the dancers. God, I said. I fucked up, Dan. I fucked it all up. He didn't say anything, and that was the same as agreeing. Driving back to the hotel... I decided I needed to talk to Kim. She was a problem I didn't need, maybe a problem I could solve. I pulled a screeching U-turn and drove the little runabout to her place, a tiny condo in a crumbling complex that had once been a gated seniors' village pre-Bitchen. Her place was easy to spot, all the lights were burning, faint conversation audible through the screen door. I jogged up the steps two at a time and was about to knock when a familiar voice drifted through the screen. Deborah, saying... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Terrific idea. I'd never really thought about using streetmosphere players to lighten up the queue area, but you're making a lot of sense. You people have just been doing the best work over at the mansion. Find me more like you, and I'll take them for the hall any day. I heard Kim and her young friends chatting excitedly, proudly, the anger and fear suffused me from tip to toe, and I felt suddenly light and cool and ready to do something terrible. I padded silently down the steps and got into my runabout. Some people never learn. I'm one of them, apparently. I almost chortled over the foolproof simplicity of my plan as I slipped in through the cast entrance using the ID card I'd scored when my systems went offline and I was no longer able to squirt my authorization at the door. I changed clothes in a bathroom on Main Street, switching into a black cowl that completely obscured my features, then slunk through the shadows along the storefronts until I came to the moat around Cinderella's castle. Keeping low, I stepped over the fence and duck-walked down the embankment, then slipped into the water and sloshed across to the Adventureland side. Slipping along to the Liberty Square gateway, I flattened myself in doorways whenever I heard maintenance crews passing in the distance until I reached the Hall of Presidents, and in a twinkling, I was inside the theatre itself. Humming the small world theme, I produced a short wrecking bar from my cowl's tabbed pocket and set to work. The primary broadcast units were hidden behind a painted scrim over the stage, and they were surprisingly well built for a first-generation tech. I really worked up a sweat smashing them, but I kept at it until not a single component remained recognisable. The work was slow and loud in the silent park, but it lulled me into a sleepy reverie, an auto-hypnotic swing-bang, swing-bang, timeless time. To be on the safe side, I grabbed the storage units and slipped them into the cowl. Locating their backup units was a little trickier, but years of hanging out at the Hall of Presidents while Lil tinkered with the animatronics helped me. I methodically investigated every nook, cranny and storage area until I located them, 
in what had been a breakroom closet. By now I had the rhythm of the thing, and I made short work of them. I did one more pass, wrecking anything that looked like it might be a prototype for the next generation, or notes that would help them reconstruct the units I'd smashed. I had no illusions about Deborah's preparedness. She'd have something off-site that she could get up and running in a few days. I wasn't doing anything permanent. I was just buying myself a day or two. I made my way clean out of the park without being spotted, and sloshed my way into my runabout, shoes leaking water from the moat. For the first time in weeks, I slept like a baby. Of course, I got caught. I don't really have the temperament for Machiavellian shenanigans, and I left a trail a mile wide, from the muddy footprints in the contemporary's lobby to the wrecking bar thoughtlessly left behind with my cowl and the storage units from the hall forgotten on the back seat of my runabout. I whistled my personal jazzy, up-tempo version of Grim Grinning Ghosts as I made my way from costuming through the utility door out to Liberty Square half an hour before the park opened. Standing in front of me were Lil and Deborah. Deborah was holding my cowl and wrecking bar. Lil held the storage units. I hadn't put on my transdermals that morning, and so the emotion I felt was unmuffled, loud and yammering. I ran. I ran past them, along the road to Adventureland, past the tiki room where I'd been killed, past the Adventureland gate where I'd waded down the moat, down Main Street. I ran and ran, elbowing early guests, trampling flowers, knocking over an apple cart across from the Penny Arcade. I ran until I reached the main gate and turned, thinking I'd outrun Lil and Deborah and all my problems. I thought wrong. They were both there, a step behind me, puffing and red. Deborah held my wrecking bar like a weapon, and she brandished it at me. "'You're a goddamn idiot, you know that?' she said. I think if we'd been alone, she would have swung it at me. "'Can't take it when someone else plays rough, huh, Deborah?' I sneered. Lil shook her head disgustedly. "'She's right. You're an idiot. The ad hoc's meeting in Adventureland. You're coming.' "'Why?' I asked, feeling belligerent. You're going to honour me for all my hard work? We're going to talk about the future, Julius. What's left of it for us? Oh, for God's sake, Lil, can't you see what's going on? They killed me. They did it. And now we're fighting each other instead of her. Why can't you see how wrong that is? You'd better watch those accusations, Julius, Deborah said, quietly and intensely, almost hissing. I don't know who killed you or why, but you're the one who's guilty here. You need help. I barked a humorless laugh. Guests were starting to stream into the now open park, and several of them were watching intently as the three costumed cast members shouted at each other. I could feel my wuffy hemorrhaging. Deborah, you are purely full of shit, and your work is trite and unimaginative. You're a fucking despoiler, and you don't even have the guts to admit it. That's enough, Julius, Lil said, her face hard, her rage barely in check. We're going. Deborah walked a pace behind me, Lil a pace before, all the way through the crowd to Adventureland. I saw a dozen opportunities to slip into a gap into the human ebb and flow and escape custody, but I didn't try. I wanted a chance to tell the world what I'd done and why I'd done it. Deborah followed us in when we mounted the steps to the meeting room. Lil turned. I don't think you should be here, Deborah, she said in measured tones. Deborah shook her head. You can't keep me out, you know. And you shouldn't want to. We're on the same side. I snorted derisively, and I think it decided Lil. Come on, then, she said. It was SRO in the meeting room, packed to the gills with the entire ad hoc except for my new recruits. No work was being done on the rehab then, and the Liberty Bell would be sitting at her dock. Even the restaurant crews were there. Liberty Square must have been a ghost town. It gave the meeting a sense of urgency, the knowledge that there were guests in Liberty Square wandering aimlessly, looking for cast members to help them out. Of course, Deborah's crew might have been around. The crowd's faces were hard and bitter, leaving no doubt in my mind that I was in deep shit. Even Dan, sitting in the front row, looked angry. I nearly started crying right then. Dan. Oh, Dan. 
my pal, my confidant, my patsy, my rival, my nemesis, Dan, Dan, Dan. I wanted to beat him to death and hug him at the same time. Lil took the podium and tucked stray hairs behind her ears. All right, then, she said. I stood to her left and Deborah stood to her right. Thanks for coming out today. I'd like to get this done quickly. We all have important work to get to. I'll run down the facts. Last night, a member of this ad hoc vandalised the Hall of Presidents, rendering it useless. It's estimated that it will take at least a week to get it back up and running. I don't have to tell you that this isn't acceptable. This has never happened before, and it will never happen again. We're going to see to that. I'd like to propose that no further work be done on the mansion until the Hall of Presidents is fully operational. I will be volunteering my services on the repairs. There were nods in the audience. Lil wouldn't be the only one working at the Hall that week. Disney World isn't a competition, Lil said. All the different ad hocs work together, and we do it to make the park as good as we can. We lose sight of that at our peril. I nearly gagged on bile. I'd like to say something, I said, as calmly as I could manage. Lil shot me a look. That's fine, Julius. Any member of the ad hoc can speak. I took a deep breath. I did it, all right, I said. My voice cracked. I did it and I don't have any excuse for having done it. It may not have been the smartest thing I've ever done, but I think you all should understand how I was driven to it. We're not supposed to be in competition with one another here, but we all know that's just a polite fiction. The truth is that there's real competition in the park, and that the hardest players are the crew that rehabbed the Hall of Presidents. They stole the Hall from you. They did it while you were distracted. They used me to engineer the distraction. They murdered me. I heard the shriek creaking into my voice, but I couldn't do anything about it. Usually, the lie that we're all on the same side is fine. It lets us work together in peace, but that changed the day they had me shot. If you keep on believing it, you're going to lose the mansion, the Liberty Bell, Tom Sawyer Island, all of it. All the history we have in this place, all the history that the billions who visited it have, it's going to be destroyed and replaced with the sterile, thoughtless shit that's taken over the hall. Once that happens, there's nothing left that makes this place special. Anyone can get the same experience sitting at home on the sofa. What happens then, huh? How much longer do you think this place will stay open once the only people here are you? Deborah smiled condescendingly. Are you finished, then? she asked sweetly. Fine. I know I'm not a member of this group, but since it was my work that was destroyed last night, I think I would like to address Julius's statements, if you don't mind. She paused, but no one spoke up. First of all, I want you all to know that we don't hold you responsible for what happened last night. We know who was responsible, and he needs help. I urge you to see to it that he gets it. Next, I'd like to say that, as far as I'm concerned, we are on the same side. The side of the park. This is a special place, and it couldn't exist without all our contributions. Whatever happened to Julius was terrible, and I sincerely hope that the person responsible is caught and brought to justice. But that person wasn't me, or any of the people in my ad hoc. Lil, I'd like to thank you for your generous offer of assistance, and we'll take you up on it. That goes for all of you. Come on by the hall. We'll put you to work. We'll be up and running in no time. Now, as far as the mansion goes, let me say this once and for all. Neither me nor my ad hoc any desire to take over the operations of the mansion. It's a terrific attraction, and it's getting better with the work you're all doing. If you've been worrying about it, then you can stop worrying now. We're all on the same side. Thanks for hearing me out. I've got to go and see my team now. She turned and left. A chorus of applause followed her out. Lil waited until it died down and then said, All right, we've got work to do. I'd like to ask you all a favour first. 
I'd like us to keep the details of last night's incident to ourselves. Letting the guests in the world know about this ugly business isn't good for anyone. Can we all agree on that? There was a moment's pause while the results were tabulated on the HUDs. Then Lil gave them a million-dollar smile. I knew you'd come through. Thanks, guys. Let's get to work. I spent the day at the hotel, listlessly scrolling around on my terminal. Lil had made it very clear to me after the meeting that I wasn't to show my face inside the park until I'd gotten help, whatever that meant. By noon, the news was out. It was hard to pin down the exact source, but it seemed to revolve around the new recruits. One of them had told their net pals about the high drama in Liberty Square and mentioned my name. There were already a couple of sites vilifying me, and I expected more. I needed some kind of help, that was for sure. I thought about leaving them, turning my back on the whole business, and leaving Walt Disney World to start yet another life, wuffy poor and fancy free. It wouldn't be so bad. I'd been in poor repute before, not so long ago. That first time Dan and I had palled around back in the U of T, I'd been the centre of a lot of pretty ambivalent sentiment, and wuffy poor as a man can be. I slept in a little coffin on campus, perfectly climate-controlled. It was cramped and dull, but my access to the network was free, and I had plenty of material to entertain myself. While I couldn't get a table in a restaurant, I was free to queue up at any of the makers around town and get myself whatever I wanted to eat and drink whenever I wanted it. Compared to 99.999% of the people who'd ever lived, I had a life of unparalleled luxury. Even by the standards of the bitchin society, I was hardly a rarity. The number of low-esteem individuals at large was significant, and they got along just fine, hanging out in parks, arguing, reading, staging plays, playing music. Of course, that wasn't the life for me. I had Dan to pal around with, a rare, high-net, wuffy individual who was willing to fraternise with a schmuck like me. He'd stab me to meals at sidewalk cafes and concerts at the Sky Dome, and shoot down any snotty reputation punk who sneered at my wuffy tally. Being with Dan was a process of constantly re-evaluating my beliefs in the bitchin' society, and I'd never had a more vibrant, thought-provoking time in all my life. I could have left the park, dead-headed to anywhere in the world, started over. I could have turned my back on Dan, on Deborah, on Lil and the whole mess. I didn't. I called up the dock. Chapter 8 Dr. Pete answered on the third ring, audio only. In the background I heard a chorus of crying children, the constant backdrop of the Magic Kingdom infirmary. Hi, Doc, I said. Hello, Julius. What can I do for you? Under the veneer of professional medical and cast member friendliness, I sensed irritation. Make it all good again. I'm not really sure. I wanted to see if I could talk it over with you. I'm having some pretty big problems. I'm on shift until five. Can it wait until then? By then, I had no idea if I'd have the nerve to see him. I didn't think so. I was hoping we could meet right away. If it's an emergency, I can have an ambulance sent for you. It's urgent, but not an emergency. I need to talk about it in person. Please? He sighed in undoctorly, uncast-memberly fashion. Julius, I've got important things to do here. Are you sure this can't wait? I bit back a sob. I'm sure, Doc. All right, then. When can you be here? Lil had made it clear she didn't want me in the park. Can you meet me? I can't really come to you. I'm at the Contemporary, Tower B, room 2334. I don't really make house calls, son. I know, I know. I hated how pathetic I sounded. Can you make an exception? I don't know who else to turn to. I'll be there as soon as I can. I'll have to get someone to cover for me. Let's not make a habit of this, all right? I whooshed out my relief. I promise. He disconnected abruptly, and I found myself dialing Dan. Yes, he said cautiously. Dr. Pete is coming over, Dan. I don't know if he can help me. I don't know if anyone can. I just wanted you to know. He surprised me then, and made me remember why he was still my friend, even after everything. Do you want me to come over? That would be very nice, I said quietly. I'm at the hotel. Give me ten minutes, he said, and rang off. 
He found me on my patio, looking out at the castle and the peaks of Space Mountain. To my left spread the sparkling waters of the Seven Seas Lagoon. To my right, the property stretched away from mile after manicured mile. The sun was warm on my skin, faint strains of happy laughter drifted with the wind, and the flowers were in bloom. In Toronto, it would be freezing rain, noisome rapid transit a monorail hissed by, and hard-faced anonymity. I missed it. Dan pulled up a chair next to mine and sat without a word. We both stared out at the view for a long while. "'It's something else, isn't it?' I said finally. "'I suppose so,' he said. "'I want to say something before the doc comes by, Julius.' "'Go ahead.' "'Lil and I are through. It should never have happened in the first place, and I'm not proud of myself. If you two were breaking up, that's none of my business, but I had no right to hurry it along.' All right, I said. I was too drained for emotion. I've taken a room here, moved my things. How's Lil taking it? Oh, she thinks I'm a total bastard. I suppose she's right. I suppose she's partly right, I corrected him. He gave me a gentle slug in the shoulder. Thanks. We waited in companionable silence until the doc arrived. He bustled in, his smile lines drawn up into a sour purse and waited expectantly, I left Dan on the patio while I took a seat on the bed. "'I'm cracking up or something,' I said. "'I've been acting erratically, sometimes violently. "'I don't know what's wrong with me.' I'd rehearsed the speech, but it still wasn't easy to choke out. "'We both know what's wrong with you, Julius,' the doc said impatiently. "'You need to be refreshed from your backup. "'Get set up with a fresh clone and retire this one. "'We've had this talk.' "'I can't do it,' I said not meeting his eye. I just can't. Is there another way? The doc shook his head. Julius, I've got limited resources to allocate. There's a perfectly good cure for what's ailing you, and if you won't take it, there's not much I can do for you. But what about meds? Your problem isn't a chemical imbalance. It's a mental defect. Your brain is broken, son. All that meds will do is mask the symptoms while you get worse. I can't tell you what you want to hear, unfortunately. Now, if you're ready to take the cure, I can retire this clone immediately and get you restored into a new one in 48 hours. Isn't there another way? Please, you have to help me. I can't lose all this. I couldn't admit my real reasons for being so attached to this singularly miserable chapter in my life, not even to myself. The doctor rose to go... Look, Julius, you haven't got the wuffy to make it worth anyone's time to research a solution to this problem, other than the one that we all know about. I can give you mood suppressants, but that's not a permanent solution. Why not? He boggled. You can't just take dope for the rest of your life, son. Eventually something will happen to this body. I see from your file that you're stroke-prone, and you're going to get refreshed from your backup. The longer you wait the more traumatic it'll be. You're robbing from your future self for your selfish present. It wasn't the first time the thought had crossed my mind. Every passing day made it harder to take the cure. To lie down and wake up friends with Dan. To wake up and be in love with Lil again. To wake up to a mansion the way I remembered it. A hall of presidents where I could find Lil bent over with her head in a president's guts of an afternoon. To lie down and wake without disgrace, without knowing that my lover and my best friend would betray me, had betrayed me. I just couldn't do it. Not yet, anyway. Dan was going to kill himself soon, and if I restored myself from my old backups, I'd lose my last year with him. I'd lose his last year. Let's table that, Doc. I hear what you're saying, but there are complications. I guess I'll take the mood suppressants for now. He gave me a cold look. I'll give you a script, then. I could have done that without coming out here. Please don't call me any more. I was shocked by his obvious ire, but I didn't understand it until he was gone, and I told Dan what had happened. Us old-timers were used to thinking of doctors as highly trained professionals. All that pre-bitch and med school stuff, long internships, anatomy drills. Truth is, the average doc today gets more training in bedside manner than bioscience. Dr. Pete is a technician, not an MD, not the way you and I mean it. Anyone with the kind of knowledge you're looking for is working as a historical researcher, not a doctor. But that's not the illusion. 
The Doc is supposed to be the authority on medical matters, even though he's only got one trick, restore from backup. You're reminding Pete of that, and he's not happy to have it happen. I waited a week before returning to the Magic Kingdom, sunning myself on the white sand beach at the Contemporary, jogging the walk around the world, taking a canoe out to the wild and overgrown Discovery Island, and generally cooling out. Dan came by in the evenings, and it was like old times, running down the pros and cons of Wuffy and bitchinery and life in general, sitting on my porch with a sweating pitcher of lemonade. On the last night, he presented me with a clever little handheld, a museum piece that I recalled fondly from the dawning days of the Bitchin Society. It had much of the functionality of my defunct systems in a package I could slip in my shirt pocket. It felt like part of a costume, like the turnip watches the Ben Franklin Streetmosphere players wore at the American Adventure. Museum piece or no, it meant that I was once again qualified to participate in the Bitchin Society, albeit more slowly and less efficiently than I once may have. I took it downstairs the next morning and drove to the Magic Kingdom's cast member lot. At least, that was the plan. When I got down to the Contemporary's parking lot, my runabout was gone. A quick check with the handheld revealed the worst. My wuffy was low enough that someone had just gotten inside and driven away, realising that they could make more popular use of it than I could. With a sinking feeling, I trudged up to my room and swiped my key through the lock. It emitted a soft, unsatisfied bzzz and lit up. Please see the front desk. My room had been reassigned. I had the short end of the Wuffy stick. At least there was no mandatory Wuffy check on the monorail platform, but the other people on the car were none too friendly to me, and no one offered me an inch more personal space than was necessary. I had hit bottom. I took the cast member entrance to the Magic Kingdom, clipping my name tag to my Disney Operations polo shirt, ignoring the glares of my fellow cast members in the utility doors. I used the handheld to page Dan. Hey there, he said brightly. I could tell instantly that I was being humoured. Where are you? I asked. Oh, up in the square, by the Liberty Tree. In front of the Hall of Presidents. I worked the handheld, pinged some wuffy manually, Deborah was spiked so high it seemed she'd never come down, as were Tim and her whole crew in aggregate. They were drawing from guests by the millions, and from cast members, and from people who'd read the popular accounts of their struggle against the forces of petty jealousy and sabotage, i.e. me. I felt light-headed. I hurried along to costuming and changed into the heavy green mansion costume, then ran up the stairs to the square. I found Dan sipping a coffee and sitting on a bench under the giant lantern-hung liberty tree. He had a second cup waiting for me, and patted the bench next to him. I sat with him and sipped, waiting for him to spill whatever bit of rotten news he had for me this morning. I could feel it hovering like storm clouds. He wouldn't talk, though, not until we finished the coffee. Then he stood and strolled over to the mansion. It wasn't rope drop yet, and there weren't any guests in the park, which was all for the better, given what was coming next. Have you taken a look at Deborah's Wuffy lately? He asked finally as we stood by the pet cemetery, considering the empty scaffolding. I started to pull out the handheld, but he put a hand on my arm. Don't bother, he said morosely. Suffice it to say, Deborah's gang is number one with a bullet. Ever since word got out about what happened to the hall, they've been stacking it deep. They can do just about anything, Jules, and get away with it. My stomach tightened, and I found myself grinding my molars. So what is it they've done, Dan? I said. I asked, already knowing the answer. Dan didn't have to respond, because at that moment Tim emerged from the mansion, wearing a light cotton work smock. He had a thoughtful expression, and when he saw us he beamed his elfin grin and came over. Hey guys, he said. Hi, Tim, Dan said. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. Pretty exciting stuff, huh? he said. I haven't told him yet, Dan said, with forced lightness. Why don't you run it down? Well, it's pretty radical, I have to admit. We've learned some stuff from the hall that we wanted to apply, and at the same time, we wanted to capture some of the historical character of the ghost story. I opened my mouth to object, but Dan put a hand on my forearm. Really? he asked innocently. How do you plan on doing that? 
Well, we're keeping the telepresence robots. That's the honey of an idea, Julius. But we're giving each one an uplink so that it can flashbake. We've got some high wuffy horror writers pulling together a series of narratives about the lives of each ghost, how they met their tragic ends, what they've done since, you know? The way we've storyboarded it, the guests stream through the ride pretty much the way they do now, walking through the pre-show and then getting into the ride vehicles, the doom buggies. But here's the big change. We slow it all down. We trade off throughput for intensity, make it more of a premium product. So, you're a guest. From the queue to the unload zone, you're being chased by these ghosts, these telepresence robots, and they're really scary. I've got Sunneep's concept artists going back to the drawing board, hitting basic research on stuff that'll just scare the guests silly. When a ghost catches you, lays its hands on you, wham! Flashbake. You get its whole grisly story in three seconds across your frontal lobe. By the time you've left, you've had ten or more ghost contacts, and the next time you come back, it's all new ghosts with all new stories. The way the hall's drawing them, we're bound to be a hit. He put his hands behind his back and rocked on his heels, clearly proud of himself. When Epcot Centre first opened long, long ago, there had been an ugly decade or so of in-ride design. Imagineering found a winning formula for Spaceship Earth, the flagship ride in a big golf ball, and in their drive to establish thematic continuity, they'd turned the formula into a cookie cutter, stamping out half a dozen clones for each of the themed areas in the future showcase. It went like this. First, we were cavemen, then there was ancient Greece, then Rome burned, Q sulfur odour FX, then there was the Great Depression, and finally, we reached the modern age. Who knows what the future holds? We do. We'll all have video phones and be living on the ocean floor. Once was cute, compelling and inspirational even, but six times was embarrassing. Like everyone, once Imagineering got themselves a good hammer, everything started to resemble a nail. Even now, the Epcot ad hocs were repeating the sins of their forebears, closing every ride with a scene of bitchin' utopia. And Deborah was repeating the same classic mistake, tearing her way through the Magic Kingdom with her blaster set to flashbake. Tim, I said, hearing the tremble in my voice, I thought you said you had no designs on the mansion, that you and Deborah wouldn't be trying to take it away from us. Didn't you say that? Tim rocked back as if I'd slapped him and the blood drained from his face. But we're not taking it away, he said. You invited us to help. I shook my head, confused. We did, I said. Sure, he said. Yes, Dan said. Kim and some of the other rehab cast went to Deborah yesterday and asked her to do a design review of the current rehab and suggest any changes. She was good enough to agree, and they've come up with some great ideas. I read between the lines. The newbies you invited in have gone over to the other side, and we're going to lose everything because of them. I felt like shit. Well, I stand corrected, I said carefully. Tim's grin came back and he clapped his hands together. He really loves the mansion, I thought. He could have been on our side if only we'd played it right. Dan and I took to the utility doors and grabbed a pair of bicycles and sped towards Sunneep's lab, jangling our bells at the rushing cast members. They don't have the authority to invite Deborah in, I panted as we pedalled. Says who? Dan said. It was part of the deal. They knew that they were probationary members right from the start. They weren't even allowed into the design meetings. Looks like they took themselves off probation, he said. Sunip gave us both a chilly look when we entered his lab. He had dark circles under his eyes and his hands shook with exhaustion. He seemed to be holding himself erect with nothing more than raw anger. So much for building without interference, he said. We agreed that this project wouldn't change midway through. Now it has, and I've got other commitments that I'm going to have to cancel because this is going off schedule. I made soothing, apologetic gestures with my hands. Sonny, believe me, I'm just as upset about this as you are. We don't like this one little bit. He harumphed. We had a deal, Julius, he said hotly. I would do the rehab for you, and you would keep the ad hocs off my back. I've been holding up my end of the bargain, but where the hell have you been? If they replan the rehab now, I'll have to go along with them. I can't just leave the mansion half done. They'll murder me. The kernel of a plan formed in my mind. Sonny, 
We don't like the new rehab plan, and we're going to stop it. You can help. Just stonewall them. Tell them they'll have to find other Imagineering support if they want to go through with it, that your book's solid. Dan gave me one of his long, considering looks, then nodded a minute approval. Yeah, he drawled. That'll help, all right. Just... Tell them that they're welcome to make any changes they want to the plan if they can find someone else to execute them. Sunip looked unhappy. Fine. So then they go and find someone else to do it, and that person gets all the credit for the work my team's done so far. I just flush my time down the toilet. It won't come to that, I said quickly. If you can just keep saying no for a couple of days, we'll do the rest. Sunip looked doubtfully. I promise, I said. Sunip ran his stubby fingers through his already crazied hair. All right, he said morosely. Dan slapped him on the back. Good man, he said. It should have worked. It almost did. I sat in the back of the Adventureland conference room while Dan exhorted. Look, you don't have to roll over for Deborah and her people. This is your garden, and you've tended it responsibly for years. She's got no right to move in on you. You've got all the wuffy you need to defend this place if you all work together. No cast member likes confrontation, and the Liberty Square bunch were tough to rouse to action. Dan had turned down the air conditioning an hour before the meeting and closed up all the windows, so that the room was a kiln for hard-firing irritation into rage. I stood meekly at the back as far as possible from Dan. He was working his magic on my behalf, and I was content to let him do his thing. When Lil had arrived, she'd sized up the situation with a sour expression, sit in the front near Dan or in the back near me. She'd chosen the middle, and to concentrate on Dan, I had to tear my eyes away from the sweat glistening on her long, pale neck. Dan stalked the aisles like a preacher, eyes blazing. They're stealing your future. They're stealing your past. They claim they've got your support. He lowered his tone. I don't think that's true. He grabbed a cast member by her hand and looked into her eyes. Is it true? he said, so low it was almost a whisper. No, the cast member said. He dropped her hand and whirled to face another cast member. Is it true? he demanded, raising his voice slightly. No, the cast member said, his voice unnaturally loud after the whispers. A nervous chuckle rippled through the crowd. Is it true? he said, striding to the podium, shouting now. No, the crowd roared back. No, he shouted back. You don't have to roll over and take it. You can fight back. Carry on with the plan. Send them packing. They're only taking over because you're letting them. Are you going to let them? No. Bitchin wars are rare. Long before anyone tries a takeover of anything, they've done the arithmetic and ensured themselves that the ad hoc they're displacing doesn't have any hope of fighting back. For the defenders, it's a simple decision. Step down gracefully and salvage some reputation out of the thing. Fighting back will surely burn away even that meagre reward. No one benefits from fighting back, least of all the thing everyone's fighting over. For example... It was the second year of my undergrad, taking a double major in not making trouble for my profs and keeping my mouth shut. It was the early days of bitchin', and most of us were still a little unclear on the concept. Not all of us, though. A group of campus shit-disturbers, grad students in the sociology department, were on the bleeding edge of the revolution, and they knew what they wanted. Control of the department. Oustering of the tyrannical, stodgy profs, a bully pulpit from which to preach the bitch and gospel to a generation of impressionable undergrads who were too cowed by their workloads to realise what a load of shit they were being fed by the university. At least, that's what the intense, heavy-set woman who seized the mic at my SOC 200 course said that sleepy morning mid-semester at Convocation Hall. Nineteen hundred students filled the hall, a capacity crowd of bleary, coffee-sipping time-markers, and they woke up in a hurry when the woman's strident harangue burst over their head. I saw it happen from the very start. The prof was down there on the stage, a speck with a tie mic, droning over his slides, and then there was a blur as a half a dozen grad students rushed the stage. They were dressed in university poverty chic, wrinkled slacks and tattered sports coats, and five of them formed a human wall in front of the prof, while the sixth, the heavy-set one with the dark hair and the prominent mole on her cheek, unclipped his mic and clipped it onto her lapel. "'Wakey, wakey!' she called. 
and the reality of the moment hit home for me. This wasn't on the lesson plan. Come on, heads up, this is not a drill. The University of Toronto Department of Sociology is under new management. If you'll set your handhelds to receive, we'll be beaming out new lesson plans momentarily. If you've forgotten your handhelds, you can download the plans later on. I'm going to run it down for you right now, anyway. Before I start, though, I have a prepared statement for you. You'll probably hear this a couple times more today in your other classes. It's worth repeating. Here goes. We reject the stodgy, tyrannical rule of the profs at this department. We demand bully pulpits from which to preach the bitch and gospel. Effective immediately, the University of Toronto ad hoc sociology department is in charge. We promise high relevance curriculum with an emphasis on reputation economies, post-scarcity social dynamics, and the social theory of infinite life extension. No more Durkheim kids, just deadheading. This will be fun. She taught the course like a pro. You could tell that she'd been drilling her lecture for a while. Periodically, the human wall behind her shuddered as the prof made a break for it and was restrained. At precisely 9.50am, she dismissed the class, which had hung on her every word. Instead of trudging out and ambling to our next class, the whole 1900 of us rose and, as one, started buzzing to our neighbours, a roar of, Can you believe it? that followed us out the door and to our next encounter with the ad hoc sociology department. It was cool that day. I had another sock class, constructing social deviance, and we got the same drill there, the same stirring propaganda, the same comical sight of a tenured prof battering himself against a human wall of ad hocs. Reporters pounced on us when we left the class, jabbing at us with their mics and peppering us with questions. I gave them a big thumbs up and said, "'Bitchin!' in classic undergrad eloquence. The prof struck back the next morning. I got a heads-up from the newscast as I brushed my teeth. The dean of the Department of Sociology told a reporter that the ad hoc courses would not be credited, that they were gangs of thugs who were totally unqualified to teach. A counterpoint interview from a spokesperson for the ad hocs established that all of the new lecturers had been writing course plans and lecture notes for the profs they replaced for years and that they'd also written most of their journal articles. The profs brought university security out to help them regain their lecterns, only to be repelled by ad hoc security guards in homemade uniforms. University security got the message. Anyone could be replaced, and stayed away. The profs picketed. They held classes out front, attended by grade-conscious brown noses, who worried that the ad hoc's classes wouldn't count towards their degrees, Fools like me alternated between the outdoor and indoor classes, not learning much of anything. No one did. The profs spent their course times whoring for waffy, leading the seminars like encounter groups instead of lectures. The ad hocs spent their time bad-mouthing the profs and tearing apart their coursework. At the end of the semester, everyone got a credit, and the university senate disbanded the sociology programme in favour of a distance ed offering from Concordia in Montreal. Forty years later, the fight was settled forever. Once you took back up and restore, the rest of Bitchinry just followed, a value system settling over you. Those who didn't take back up and restore may have objected, but hey, they all died. The Liberty Square ad hocs marched shoulder to shoulder through the utility doors and, as a mass, took back the haunted mansion. Dan, Lil and I were up front, careful not to brush against one another as we walked quickly through the backstage door and started a bucket brigade, passing out the materials that Deborah's people had stashed there, along a line that snaked back to the front porch of the Hall of Presidents where they were unceremoniously dropped. Once the main stash was vacated, we split up and roamed the ride, its service corridors and dioramas, the break rooms and the secret passages, rounding up every scrap of Deborah's crap and passing it out the door. In the attic scene, I ran into Kim and three of her giggly little friends, their eyes glinting in the dim light. The gaggle of transhuman kids made my guts clench, made me think of Zed and of Lil and of my unmediated brain, and I had a sudden urge to shred them verbally. No. No, that way lay madness and war. This was about taking back what was ours, not punishing the interlopers. Kim, I think you should leave, I said quietly. She snorted and gave me a dire look. "'Who died and made you boss?' she said. Her friends thought it very brave. They made it clear with double-jointed hip thrusts and glares. "'Kim, 
You can leave now, or you can leave later. The longer you wait, the worse it will be for you and your Wuffy. You blew it, and you're not part of the mansion anymore. Go home. Go to Deborah. Don't stay here. Don't ever come back. Ever. Ever. Be cast out of this thing that you love, that you obsess over, that you worked for. Now, I said, quiet, dangerous, barely in control. They sauntered into the graveyard, hissing vitriol at me. Oh, they had lots of new material to post to the anti-me sites. Messages that would get them wuffy with people who thought I was the scum of the earth. A popular view these days. I got out of the mansion and looked at the bucket brigade, following it to the front of the hall. The park had been open for an hour and a herd of guests watched the proceedings in confusion. The Liberty Square ad hocs passed their loads around in clear embarrassment, knowing that they were violating every principle they cared about. As I watched, gaps appeared in the bucket brigade as cast members slipped away, faces burning scarlet with shame. At the Hall of Presidents, Deborah presided over an orderly relocation of her things, a cheerful cadre of her cast members quickly moving it all off stage. I didn't have to look at my handheld to know what was happening to our Wuffy. By evening, we were back on schedule. Sunip supervised the placement of his telepresence rigs and Lil went over every system in minute detail, bossing a crew of ad hocs that trailed behind her, double and triple checking it all. Sunip smiled at me when he caught sight of me, hands scattering dust in the parlour. "'Congratulations, sir,' he said and shook my hand. "'It was masterfully done.' "'Thanks, Sunip. I'm not sure how masterful it was, but we got the job done and that's what counts.' Your partners, they're happier than I've seen them since this whole business started. I know how they feel. My partners? Oh, yes, Dan and Lil. How happy were they, I wondered. Happy enough to get back together? My mood fell, even though a part of me said that Dan would never go back to her. Not after all we'd been through together. I'm glad you're glad. We couldn't have done it without you, and it looks like we'll be open for business in a week. Oh, I should think so. Are you coming to the party tonight? Party? Probably something the Liberty Square ad hocs were putting on. I would almost certainly be persona non grata. I don't think so, I said carefully. I'll probably work late here. He chided me for working too hard, but once he saw that I had no intention of being dragged to the party, he left off. And that's how I came to be in the mansion at 2am the next morning, dozing in a backstage break room when I heard a commotion from the parlour. Festive voices, happy and loud and I assumed it was the Liberty Square ad hocs coming back from their party. I roused myself and entered the parlour. Kim and her friends were there, pushing hand trucks of Deborah's gear. I got ready to shout something horrible at them, and that's when Deborah came in. I moderated the shout to a snap, opened my mouth to speak, and stopped. Behind Deborah were Lil's parents, frozen these long years in their canopic jars in Kissimmee. Chapter 9 Lil's parents went into their jars with little ceremony. I saw them just before they went in, when they stopped in at Lil's and my place to kiss her goodbye and wish her well. Tom and I stood awkwardly to the side while Lil and her mother held an achingly chipper and polite farewell. So, I said to Tom, deadheading. He cocked an eyebrow. Yep, took the back up this morning. Before coming to see their daughter, they'd taken their backups. When they woke, this event, everything following the backup, would never have happened for them. God, they were bastards. When are you coming back? I asked, keeping my cast member face on, carefully hiding away the disgust. We'll be sampling monthly, just getting a digest dumped to us. When things look interesting enough, we'll come on back. He waggled a finger at me. I'll be keeping an eye on you and Lillian. You treat her right, you hear? We're going to miss you two around here, I said. He pish-toshed and said, You won't even notice we're gone. This is your world now. We're just getting out of the way for a while, letting you all take a run at it. We wouldn't be going down if we didn't have faith in you two. Lil and her mum kissed one last time. Her mother was more affectionate than I'd ever seen her, even to the point of tearing up a little. Here in this moment of vanishing consciousness, she could be whomever she wanted, knowing that it would never matter the next time she awoke. Julius, she said, taking my hands, squeezing them, you've got some wonderful times ahead of you. Between Lil and the park, you're going to have a tremendous experience. I just know it. She was infinitely serene and compassionate, and I knew it didn't count. Still smiling, 
They got into their runabout and drove away to get the lethal injections to become disembodied consciousnesses, to lose their last moments with their darling daughter. They were not happy to be returned from the dead. Their new bodies were impossibly young, pubescent and hormonal and doleful and kitted out in the latest trendy styles. In the company of Kim and her pals, they made a solid mass of irate adolescence. Just what the hell do you think you're doing? Rita asked, shoving me hard in the chest. I stumbled back into my carefully scattered dust, raising a cloud. Rita came after me, but Tom held her back. Julius, go away. Your actions are totally indefensible. Keep your mouth shut and go away. I held up a hand, tried to wave away his words, opened my mouth to speak. Don't say a word, he said. Leave, now. Don't stay here and don't ever come back, ever, Kim said, an evil look on her face. No, I said. No, goddammit, no. You're going to hear me out and then I'm going to get Lil and her people and they're going to back me up. That's not negotiable. We stared at each other across the dim parlour. Deborah made a twiddling motion and the lights came up full and harsh. The expertly crafted gloom went away and it was just a dusty room with a fake fireplace. Let him speak, Deborah said. Rita folded her arms and glared. I did some really awful things, I said, keeping my head up, keeping my eyes on them. I can't excuse them and I don't ask you to forgive them, but that doesn't change the fact that we've put our hearts and souls into this place and it's not right to take it from us. Can't we have one constant corner of the world, one bit frozen in time for the people who love it that way? Why does your success mean our failure? Can't you see that we're carrying on your work, that we're tending a legacy you left us. Are you through? Rita asked. I nodded. This place is not a historical preserve, Julius. It's a ride. If you don't understand that, you're in the wrong place. It's not my goddamn fault that you decided your stupidity was on my behalf, and it doesn't make it any less stupid. All you've done is confirm my worst fears. Deborah's mask of impartiality slipped. You stupid, deluded asshole, she said softly. You totter around, pissing and moaning about your little murder, your little health problems. Yes, I've heard. Your little fixation on keeping things the way they are. You need some perspective, Julius. You need to get away from here. Disney World isn't good for you, and you're sure as hell... Not any good for Disney World. It would have hurt less if I hadn't come to the same conclusion myself somewhere along the way. I found the ad hoc at a Fort Wilderness campsite, sitting around a fire and singing, necking, laughing, the victory party. I trudged into the circle and hunted for Lil. She was sitting on a log, staring into the fire a million miles away. Lord, she was beautiful when she fretted. I stood in front of her for a minute and she stared right through me until I tapped her shoulder. She gave an involuntary squeak and then smiled at herself. Lil, I said, and then stopped. Your parents are home and they've joined the other side. For the first time in an age, she looked at me softly, smiled even. She patted the log next to her. I sat down, felt the heat of the fire on my face, her body heat on my side. God, how did I screw this up? Without warning, she put her arms around me and hugged me hard. I hugged her back, nose in her hair, wood smoke smell and shampoo and sweat. We did it, she whispered fiercely. I held on to her. No, we didn't. Lil, I said, and pulled away. What? she said, her eyes shining. She was stoned, I saw that now. Your parents are back. They came to the mansion. She was confused, shrinking, and I pressed on. They were with Deborah. She reeled back as if I'd slapped her. I told them I'd bring the whole group back to talk it over. She hung her head and her shoulders shook and I tentatively put an arm around her. She shook it off and sat up. She was crying and laughing at the same time. I'll have a ferry sent over, she said. I sat in the back of the ferry with Dan, away from the confused and angry ad hocs. I answered his questions with terse one-word answers and he gave up. We rode in silence, the trees on the edges of the Seven Seas Lagoon whipping back and forth in an approaching storm. The ad hoc shortcutted through the west parking lot and moved through the quiet streets of Frontierland apprehensively, a funeral procession that stopped the nighttime custodial staff in their tracks. As we drew up on Liberty Square, 
I saw that the work lights were blazing, and a tremendous work gang of Deborah's ad hocs were moving from the hall to the mansion, undoing our teardown of their work. Working alongside them were Tom and Rita, Lil's parents, sleeves rolled up, forearms bulging with new toned muscle. The group stopped in its tracks and Lil went to them, stumbling on the wooden sidewalk. I expected hugs. There were none. In their stead, parents and daughter stalked at each other, shifting weight and posture to track each other, maintain a constant sizing distance. "'What the hell are you doing?' Lil said finally. She didn't address her mother, which surprised me. It didn't surprise Tom, though. He dipped forward, the shuffle of his feet loud in the quiet night. "'We're working,' he said. "'No, you're not,' Lil said. "'You're destroying. Stop it.' Lil's mother darted to her husband's side, not saying anything, just standing there. Wordlessly, Tom hefted the box he was holding and headed to the mansion. Lil caught his arm and jerked it so he dropped his load. You're not listening. The mansion is ours. Stop it. Lil's mother gently took Lil's hand off Tom's arm, held it in her own. I'm glad you're passionate about it, Lillian, she said. I'm proud of your commitment. Even at a distance of ten yards, I heard Lil's choked sob, saw her collapse in on herself. Her mother took her in her arms, rocked her. I felt like a voyeur, but couldn't bring myself to turn away. Shh, her mother said, a sibilant sound that matched the rustling of the leaves of the liberty tree. Shh, we don't have to be on the same side, you know. They held the embrace and held it still. Lil straightened, then bent again and picked up her father's box, carried it to the mansion. One at a time, the rest of her ad hoc moved forward and joined them. This is how you hit bottom. You wake up in your friend's hotel room and you power up your handheld and it won't log on. You press the call button for the elevator and it gives you an angry buzz in return. You take the stairs to the lobby and no one looks at you as they jostle past you. You become a non-person. Scared, I trembled when I ascended the stairs to Dan's room, when I knocked at his door, louder and harder than I meant, a panicked banging. Dan answered the door and I saw his eyes go to his HUD, back to me. Jesus, he said. I sat on the edge of my bed, head in my hands. What? I said. What happened? What happened to me? You're out of the ad hoc, he said. You're out of Wuffy. You're bottomed out, he said. This is how you hit bottom in Walt Disney World. In a hotel with the hissing of the monorail and the sun streaming through the window, the hooting of the steam engines on the railroad and the distant howl of the recorded wolves at the haunted mansion. The world drops away from you, recedes until you're nothing but a speck, a moat in blackness. I was hyperventilating, light-headed. Deliberately I slowed my breath, put my head between my knees until the dizziness passed. Take me to Lil, I said. Driving together, hammering cigarette after cigarette into my face, I remember the night Dan had come to Disney World, when I'd driven him to my, Lil's, house, and how happy I'd been then, how secure. I looked at Dan and he patted my hand. Strange times, he said. It was enough. We found Lil in an underground break room, lightly dozing on a ratty sofa. Her head rested on Tom's lap, her feet on Rita's. All three snored softly. They'd had a long night. Dan shook Lil awake. She stretched out and opened her eyes, looking sleepily at me. The blood drained from her face. Hello, Julius, she said coldly. Now Tom and Rita were awake too. Lil sat up. Were you going to tell me? Or were you just going to kick me out and let me find out on my own? You are my next stop, Lil said. And I've saved you some time. I pulled up a chair. Tell me about it. There's nothing to tell, Rita snapped. You're out. You had to know it was coming. For God's sake, you were tearing Liberty Square apart. How would you know? I asked. I struggled to remain calm. You've been asleep for ten years. We got updates, Rita said. That's why we're back. We couldn't let it go on the way it was. We owed it to Deborah. And Lillian, Tom said. And Lillian, Rita said absently. Dan pulled up a chair on his own. You're not being fair to him, he said. At least someone was on my side. We've been more than fair, Lil said. You know that better than anyone, Dan. We've forgiven and forgiven and forgiven, made every allowance. He's sick, and he won't take the cure. There's nothing more we can do for him. You could be his friend, Dan said. 
The lightheadedness was back and I slumped in my chair, trying to control my breathing, the panicked thumping of my heart. You could try to understand. You could try to help him. You could stick with him the way he stuck with you. You don't have to just toss him out on his ass. Lil had the good grace to look slightly shamed. I'll get him a room, she said, for a month, in Kissimmee, a motel. I'll pick up his network access. Is that fair? It's more than fair, Rita said. Why did she hate me so much? I'd been there for her daughter while she was away. Ah, that might do it all right. I don't think it's warranted. If you want to take care of him, sir, you can. It's none of my family's business. Lil's eyes blazed. Let me handle this, she said. All right? Rita stood up abruptly. You do whatever you want, she said, and stormed out of the room. Why are you coming here for help, Tom said, ever the voice of reason. You seem capable enough. I'm going to be taking a lethal injection at the end of the week, Dan said. Three days. That's personal, but you asked. Tom shook his head. Some friends you've got yourself, I could see him thinking. That soon? Lil asked, a throb in her voice. Dan nodded. In a dreamlike buzz, I stood and wandered out into the utility door, out through the western cast member parking and away. I wandered along the cobbled, disused walk around the world, each flagstone engraved with the name of a family that had visited the park a century before. The names whipped past me like epitaphs. The sun came up noon high as I rounded the bend of a deserted beach between the Grand Floridian and the Polynesian. Lil and I had come here often to watch the sunset from a hammock, arms around each other, the park spread out before us like a lighted toy village. Now the beach was deserted, the wedding pavilion silent. I felt suddenly cold, though I was sweating freely. So cold. Dreamlike, I walked into the lake, water filling my shoes, logging my pants, warm as blood, warm on my chest, on my chin, on my mouth, on my eyes. I opened my mouth and inhaled deeply, water filling my lungs, choking and warm. At first I sputtered, but I was in control now, and I inhaled again. The water shimmered over my eyes, and then it was dark. I woke on Dr. Pete's cot in the Magic Kingdom, restraints around my wrists and ankles, a tube in my nose. I closed my eyes, for a moment believing that I had been restored from a backup, problem solved, memories behind me. Sorrow knifed through me as I realised that Dan was probably dead by now, my memories of him gone forever. Gradually, I realised that I was thinking nonsensically. The fact that I remembered Dan meant that I hadn't been refreshed from my backup, that my broken brain was still there, churning along in unmediated isolation. I coughed again. My ribs ached and throbbed in counterpoint to my head. Dan took my hand. You're a pain in the ass, you know that, he said, smiling. Sorry. I choked. You sure are, he said. Lucky for you they found you. Another minute or two and I'd be burying you right now. No, I thought, confused. They'd have restored me from backup. Then it hit me. I'd gone on record refusing restore from backup after having it recommended by a medical professional. No one would have restored me after that. I would have been truly, and finally, dead. I started to shiver. Easy, Dan said. Easy. It's all right now. Doctor says you've got a crapped rib or two from the CPR, but there's no brain damage. No additional brain damage, Dr. Pete said, swimming into view. He had on his professionally calm bedside face, and it reassured me despite myself. He shooed Dan away and took his seat. Once Dan had left the room, he shone lights in my eyes and peeked at my ears, then sat back and considered me. Well, Julius, he said, what exactly is the problem? We can get you a lethal injection if that's what you want, but offing yourself in the Seven Seas Lagoon just isn't good show. In the meantime, would you like to talk about it? Part of me wanted to spit in his eye. I'd tried to talk about it, and he told me to go to hell, and now he changes his mind. But I did want to talk. I didn't want to die, I said. Oh no, he said. I think the evidence suggests the contrary. I wasn't trying to die, I protested. I was trying to... What? I was trying to abdicate? Take the refresh without choosing it? Without shutting out the last year of my best friend's life? Rescue myself from the stinking pit I'd sunk into without flushing Dan away along with it? That's all. That's all. I wasn't thinking. I was just acting. It was an episode or something. Does that mean I'm nuts? Oh, probably. Dr. Pete said offhandedly, but let's worry about one thing at a time. 
You can die if you want to, that's your right. I'd rather you lived, if you want my opinion, and I doubt I'm the only one. Waffy be damned. If you're going to live, I'd like to record you saying so, just in case. We have a backup of you on file. I'd hate to have to delete it. Yes, I said. Yes, I'd like to be restored if there's no other option. It was true. I didn't want to die. All right, then, Dr. Pete said. It's on file, and I'm a happy man. Now, are you nuts? Probably. A little. Nothing a little counselling and some R&R wouldn't fix, if you want my opinion. I could find you somewhere, if you want. Not yet, I said. I appreciate the offer, but there's something else I have to do first. Dan took me back to the room and put me to bed with a transdermal soporific that knocked me out for the rest of the day. When I woke, the moon was over the Seven Seas Lagoon and the monorail was silent. I stood on the patio for a while, thinking about all the things this place had meant to me for more than a century. Happiness, security, efficiency, fantasy, all of it gone. It was time I left. Maybe back to space, find Zed and see if I could make her happy again. Anywhere but here. Once Dan was dead, God, it was sinking in finally. I could catch a ride down to the Cape for a launch. What's on your mind? Dan asked from behind me, startling me. He was in his boxes, thin and rangy and hairy. Thinking about moving on, I said. He chuckled. I've been thinking about doing the same, he said. I smiled. Not that way, I said. Just going somewhere else, starting over, getting away from this. Going to take the refresh? he asked. I looked away. No, I said. I don't believe I will. It may be none of my business, he said, but why the fuck not? Jesus, Julius, what are you afraid of? You don't want to know, I said. I'll be the judge of that. Let's have a drink first, I said. Dan rolled his eyes back for a second, then said, All right, two Coronas coming up. After the room service bot had left, we cracked the beers and pulled chairs out onto the porch. "'You sure you want to know this?' I asked. He tipped his bottle at me. "'Sure as shooting,' he said. "'I don't want refresh, because it would mean losing the last year,' I said. He nodded. "'By which you mean my last year,' he said. "'Right?' I nodded and drank. "'I thought it might be like that, Julius. "'You are many things, but hard to figure out you are not.' I have something to say that might help you make the decision, if you want to hear it, that is. What could he have to say? Sure, I said, sure. In my mind I was on a shuttle headed for orbit away from all this. I had you killed, he said. Deborah asked me to, and I set it up. You were right all along. The shuttle exploded in silent, slow-moving space, and I spun away from it. I opened and shut my mouth. It was Dan's turn to look away. Deborah proposed it. We were talking about the people I'd met when I was doing my missionary work, the stone crazies who I'd have to chase away after they'd rejoined the Bitchin Society. One of them, a girl from Cheney Mountain, she followed me down here, kept leaving me messages. I told Deborah, and that's where she got the idea. I'd get the girl to shoot you and disappear. Deborah would give me Wuffy, piles of it, and her team would follow suit. I'd be months closer to my goal. That was all I could think about back then, you remember. I remember. The smell of rejuve and desperation in our little cottage, and Dan plotting my death. We planned it, then Deborah had herself refreshed from a backup. No memory of the event, just the wuffy for me. Yes, I said. That would work. Plan a murder, kill yourself, have yourself refreshed from a backup made before the plan. How many times had Deborah done terrible things and erased their memories that way? Yes, he agreed. We did it, I'm ashamed to say. I can prove it, too. I have my backup, and I can get Janine to tell it, too. He drained his beer. That's my plan. Tomorrow. I'll tell Lil and her folks, Kim and her people, the whole ad hoc. A going-away present from a shitty friend. My throat was dry and tight. I drank more beer. You knew all along, I said. You could have proved it at any time. He nodded. That's right. You let me... I groped for the words. You let me turn into... They wouldn't come. I did, he said. All this time, Lil and he, standing on my porch, telling me I needed help. Dr. Pete telling me I needed refresh from backup. Me saying no, 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 not wanting to lose my last year with Dan. I've done some pretty shitty things in my day, he said. This is the absolute worst. You helped me, and I betrayed you. I'm sure glad I don't believe in God, That'd make what I'm going to do even scarier. 
Dan was going to kill himself in two days' time, my friend and my murderer. Dan, I croaked, I couldn't make any sense of my mind. Dan taking care of me, helping me, sticking up for me, carrying this horrible shame with him all along, ready to die, wanting to go with a clean conscience. You're forgiven, I said, and it was true. He stood. Where are you going? I asked. To find Janine, the one who pulled the trigger. I'll meet you at the Hall of Presidents at 9am. I went in through the main gate, not a cast member any more, a guest with barely enough wuffy to scrape in, use the water fountains and stand in line. If I were lucky, a cast member might spare me a chocolate banana. Probably not, though. I stood in line for the Hall of Presidents. Other guests checked my wuffy, then averted their eyes, even the children. A year before, they'd have been striking up conversations, asking me about my job here at the Magic Kingdom. I sat in my seat at the Hall of Presidents, watching the short film with the rest, sitting patiently while they rocked in their seats under the blast of the flashbake. A cast member picked up the stage-side mic and thanked everyone for coming. The doors swung open and the hall was empty, except for me. The cast member narrowed her eyes at me, then, recognising me, turned her back and went to show in the next group. No group came. Instead, Dan and the girl I'd seen on the replay entered. We've closed it down for the morning, he said. I was staring at the girl, seeing her smirk as she pulled the trigger on me, seeing her now with a contrite, scared expression. She was terrified of me. You must be Janine, I said. I stood and shook her hand. I'm Julius. Her hand was cold and she took it back and wiped it on her pants. My cast member instincts took over. Please, have a seat. Don't worry, it'll all be fine. Really, no hard feelings. I stopped short of offering to get her a glass of water. Put her at her ease, said a snotty voice in my head. She'll make a better witness, or make her nervous, pathetic. That'll work too. Make Deborah look even worse. I told the voice to shut up and got her a cup of water. By the time I got back, the whole gang was there. Deborah, Lil, her folks, Tim, Deborah's gang and Lil's gang, now one united team, soon to be scattered. Dan took the stage, used the stage-side mic to broadcast his voice. Eleven months ago, I did an awful thing. I plotted with Deborah to have Julius murdered. I used a friend who was a little confused at the time, used her to pull the trigger. It was Deborah's idea that having Julius killed would cause enough confusion that she could take over the Hall of Presidents. It was. There was a roar of conversation. I looked at Deborah, saw that she was sitting calmly, as though Dan had just accused her of sneaking an extra helping of dessert. Lil's parents to either side of her were less sanguine. Tom's jaw was set and angry. Rita was speaking angrily to Deborah. Hickory Jackson in the old hall used to say, I will hang the first man I can lay hands on from the first tree I can find. Deborah had herself refreshed from backup after we planned it, Dan went on, as though no one was talking. I was supposed to do the same, but didn't. I have a backup in my public directory. Anyone can examine it. Right now I'd like to bring Janine up. She's got a few words she'd like to say. I helped Janine take the stage. She was still trembling, and the ad hocs were an insensate babble of recriminations. Despite myself... I was enjoying it. Hello, Janine said softly. She had a lovely voice, a lovely face. I wondered if we could be friends when it was all over. She probably didn't care much about Wuffy, one way or another. The discussion went on. Dan took the mic from her and said, Please, can we have a little respect for our visitor, please, people? Gradually, the din decreased. Dan passed the mic back to Janine. Hello, she said again, and flinched from the sound of her voice in the hall's PA. My name is Janine. I'm the one who killed Julius a year ago. Dan asked me to, and I did it. I didn't ask why. I trusted... trust him. He told me that Julius would make a backup a few minutes before I shot him, and that he could get me back out of the park without getting caught. I'm very sorry. There was something off-kilter about her, some stilt to her stance and words that let you know she wasn't all there. Growing up in a mountain might do that for you. I snuck a look at Lil, whose lips were pressed together. Growing up in a theme park might do that to you too. Thank you, Janine, Dan said, taking back the mic. You can have a seat now. I've said everything I need to say. Julius and I have had our own discussions in private. If there's anyone else who'd like to speak... The words were barely out of his mouth before the crowd erupted again in words and waving hands. Beside me, Janine flinched. 
I took her hand and shouted in her ear, "'Have you ever been on the Pirates of the Caribbean?' She shook her head. I stood up and pulled her to her feet. "'You'll love it,' I said, and let her out of the hall. Chapter 10 I booked us ringside seats at the Polynesian, riding high on a fresh round of sympathy wuffy, and Dan and I drank a dozen lapu-lapus in hollowed-out pineapples before giving up on the idea of getting drunk. Janine watched the fire dances and torch lighting with eyes like saucers and picked daintily at her spare ribs with one hand, never averting her attention from the floor show. When they danced the fast hula, her eyes jiggled. I chuckled. From where we sat, I could see the spot where I'd waded into the Seven Seas Lagoon and breathed in the blood temp water. I could see Cinderella's castle across the lagoon. I could see the monorails and the ferries and the buses making their busy way through the park, shuttling teeming masses of guests from place to place. Dan toasted me with his pineapple, and I toasted him back, drank it dry, and belched in satisfaction. Full belly, good friends, and the sunset behind a troop of tawny, half-naked hula dancers. Who needs the bitch in society, anyway? When it was over, we watched the fireworks from the beach, my toes dug into the clean white sand. Dan slipped his hand into my left hand, and Janine took my right. When the sky darkened and the lighted barges putted their way through the night, we three sat in the hammock. I looked out over the Seven Seas Lagoon and realised that this was my last night ever in Walt Disney World. It was time to reboot again, start afresh. That's what the park was for, only somehow this visit I'd gotten stuck. Dan had unstuck me. The talk turned to Dan's impending death. So, tell me what you think of this, he said, hauling away on a glowing cigarette. Shoot, I said. I'm thinking, why take lethal injection? I mean, I may be done here for now, but why should I make an irreversible decision? Why did you want to before, I asked. Oh, it was the macho thing, I guess, the finality and all. But hell, I don't have to prove anything, right? Sure, I said magnanimously. So, he said thoughtfully, the question I'm asking is, how long can I deadhead for? There are folks who go down for a thousand years, ten thousand, right? So, you're thinking, what, a million? I joked. He laughed. A million? You're thinking too small, son. Try this on for size. The heat death of the universe. The heat death of the universe, I repeated. Sure, he drawled, and I sensed his grin in the dark. Ten to the hundred years or so. The stelliferous period. It's when all the black holes have run dry and things get, you know, stupendously dull. Cold, too. So I'm thinking, why not leave a wake-up call for some time around then? Sounds unpleasant to me, I said. Not at all. I figure self-repairing nano-based canopic jar, mass enough to feed it, say, a trillion ton asteroid, and a lot of solitude when the time comes around. I'll poke my head in every century or so just to see what's what, but if nothing really stupendous crops up, I'll take the long ride out, the final frontier. That's pretty cool, Janine said. Thanks, Dan said. You're not kidding, are you? I asked. Nope, I sure ain't, he said. They didn't invite me back into the ad hoc, even after Deborah left in Wuffy Penury and they started to put the mansion back the way it was. Tim called me to say that with enough support from Imagineering, they thought they could get it back up and running in a week. Sunip was ready to kill someone, I swear. A house divided against itself cannot stand, as Mr Lincoln used to say in the Hall of Presidents. I packed three changes of clothes and a toothbrush in my shoulder bag and checked out of my suite at the Polynesian at 10am, then met Janine and Dan at the valet parking out front. Dan had a runabout he'd picked up with my wuffy, and I piled in with Janine in the middle. We played old Beatles tunes on the stereo all the way to Cape Canaveral. Our shuttle lifted at dawn. The shuttle docked four hours later, but by the time we'd been through Deacon Tam and orientation it was supper time. Dan, nearly as wuffy poor as Deborah after his confession, nevertheless treated us to a meal in the big bubble, squeeze tubes of heady booze and steaky paste, and we watched the universe get colder for a while. There were a couple of guys jamming, tethered to a guitar and a set of tubs, and they weren't half bad. Janine was uncomfortable hanging there naked. She'd gone to space with her folks after Dan had left the mountain, but it was in a long-haul generation ship. She'd abandoned it after a year or two and deadheaded back to Earth in a support pod. She'd get used to life in space after a while, or she wouldn't. Well, said Dan. Yep, I said, aping his laconic drawl. 
He smiled. It's that time, he said. Spheres of saline tears formed in Janine's eyes, and I brushed them away, setting them adrift in the bubble. I'd developed some real tender brother-sister type feelings for her, since I'd washed her sorcerer eye her way through the Magic Kingdom. No romance, not for me, thanks, but camaraderie and a sense of responsibility. See you in ten to the hundred, Dan said, and headed to the airlock. I started after him, but Janine caught my hand. He hates long goodbyes, she said. I know, I said, and watched him go. The universe gets older. So do I. So does my backup, sitting in redundant distributed storage dirt side, ready for the day that space or age or stupidity kills me. It recedes with the years, and I write out my life longhand. A letter to the me that I'll be when it's restored to a clone somewhere, some when. It's important that whoever I am then knows about this year, and it's going to take a lot of tries for me to get it right. In the meantime, I'm working on another symphony, one with a little bit of grim grinning ghosts and a nod to it's a small world after all, and especially there's a great big beautiful tomorrow. Janine says it's pretty good, but what does she know? She's barely fifty. We've both got a lot of living to do before we know what's what. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom by Cory Doctorow. If you'd like to hear more classic science fiction and fantasy stories, or just want to support The Well Told Tale, please do check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with another classic story. I hope you can join me. <laughs>